Welcome to Baseball Card Illustrated, the show about our national pastime illustrated with baseball cards. I'm Bronco. And I'm Kevin. And we're here to talk about everything 1990 Fleer. <laughs> in, the, in the world of baseball cards, the one thing that is consistent is that every manufacturer makes some set every year. So there had to be a set in 1990 from Fleer. And this is the one. It's, uh, it's, it's a simple design. And we have uh, some uh, cello packs or cello packs. I don't know. I guess it depends on where you are in the country, how you say it. But... Uh, but, but no matter where you are, they pronounce this thing here the same way. <laughs> checklist. La Hall, garbage. Hall of Fame candidate checklist. <laughs> so, good year for the 1990 checklist, in fact. Batted 315 with 27 homers and 114 RBIs. So the, uh, the, the teams here are the Mets and Astros and Cardinals and Red Sox. Wow. And that leads us into a Pittsburgh Pirate. <laughs> Jeff King. Jeff King. Wow. And the thing about the, the 1990 design, I'm going to shed a little light on this now. The thing about the, 19, <laughs> the, the 1990 design is, I think it's overlooked a little bit by collectors. I think it gets a little bit of, uh, a little bit of hate from collectors. Uh, but it is, the thing that it is is very simple, right? It's, 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 a, it's a white border. It's crisp, clear photos with, uh, for the time at least, with, with backgrounds. It's, I don't know, it was kind of a return to, to baseball card innocence, right? At a, at a time when, I mean, you can look right next to it. There was what 1984 looked like. <laughs> Mads, that's huge, right? <laughs> and then, the, you know, the, the throwback 87 design. This is the simplest design of the bunch, so. I gotta say, I always like this. Part of the reason, I think, is it's a nostalgic thing for me because this was the first box I ever opened. Like, oh. the whole thing. Bought it at a card show really? when I was a kid. So, that was exciting to me. And you're right, it, it's very simple, but, you know, it kind of covers everything that a card, I guess, would need to. Here's a quick peek at the... Actually, you know, I'm gonna go on to the next player here. And... We're going to start on the back with this card. Billy and Swift. Just show what the back looks like because they show the stats sometimes. There's a did you know or some factoid on there. Now, Billy Swift was a guy that pitched for the San Diego, the San Diego, San Francisco Giants in 1992 and was just phenomenal for them. Yes, he was. And then? Not so much. Went to the Rockies. So I want you to notice here how, how Bill Swift, I'm going to turn this back off. we got a little reflection there. I want you to notice how Bill Swift is, is very um he just he looks excited right he's, he's curious or whatever he his face was not so happy when he learned that colorado is not good to <laughs> pitchers that that don't throw straight and hard anything that's curved doesn't curve very well in colorado so this was this was before it got bad for him it got good and then it got bad i'm gonna say and it was 93 he was with the giants not 92 oh when yeah they were in that great pennant race with the braves when barry bonds was just joining them and playing really well there's a hall of famer for you ozzy the wizard. And, and and with the bat, too, which is a little bit of a rarity. Because uh, when you think of Ozzie Smith, you always think about his hitting prowess. <laughs> so here's the funny thing. Ozzie Smith, think of the, the, the moments about Ozzie Smith, the, the, the moments that you can picture in your mind. It's, either, it's got to either be defense or the backflip. And then there was the home run in 1985. Right. So it's, it's interesting, right, that, that the moments – this is one of the best defensive players in the history of the game. He's, this is a guy that once made a play when he was in San Diego. He was diving towards second, and the ball kicked off the turf uh, in a weird way and went up high, and he reached behind his body with his bare hand and caught the ball as he was diving, picked it up, and threw the guy out at first base. I mean, this guy was there, – there's a reason he called him the Wizard, Wizard of Oz, because he was unbelievable – but the backflip and the homer in the 85 playoffs, to me, are the two most visual moments for him. And that it shows you how hard it is to quantify baseball and show it in terms of a defensive game. Nick Asaski, what can you tell me about him <laughs> other than he played for the Red Sox? Well, and, uh... yeah, he was, he, was okay. he was okay with the Red Sox, and then the Atlanta Braves decided they were going to try a little something. Actually, it was in 1990 that they tried to do this, I think. Let me go back and look at this. Yeah. So he played for the Reds for a long time, then the Red Sox, and then the Braves signed him. And he literally, I don't, I'm not sure he played for him, or if he did, he was a part-time player. He was supposed to be their big first base free agent signing. See, the Braves got really good in 91. But before that, they were signing all of these guys, and they were terrible. <laughs> terrible. They had a chance to trade Andres Thomas for Barry Bonds one for one and said no. 
Well, that, who wouldn't have? <laughs> so we showed you Jeff King earlier. Now I got a pair of kings with <laughs> Eric King. <laughs> I'm gonna look through the rest of these real quick to see if we get any more kings. Okay. Like a, or a queen, or is there a jack in there? Maybe like a <laughs> Jack McDowell? Would he have been around at that time? Working on a royal flush here on this edition where's of Baseball the, Card Illustrated. Where's the, where's the ten of diamonds? I, you know what? I don't see one, but I'll throw this up here. We have another pair. We got <laughs> two checklists. Two checklists. <laughs> hey, if you ever if you ever wanted to know what other cards are, you know, what they, what they look like or what players are on other cards, you can look at these cards. So 1990 me was sitting there thinking, oh man, it would have been great to get a card of all these guys that are listed here, but nope, I just got these checklists. <laughs> the and a guy like the cards. Jack Armstrong. Oh, there's a Jack. There's a Jack, but... You've got two kings, a Jack, and two checklists. <laughs> if that ain't a full house, I don't know what is. How about this one? Oh, hey. Now, that kind of looks like a prize, right? I think that's a rookie card. Let's, let it me might just be. peek on the, on the back of this here. Uh, oh, no, it's Jack Armstrong. <laughs> um, In which case, it doesn't matter if it's a rookie card. No, yeah, he. this is this is a rookie card. Larry Walker. And it's... I, you know what? Larry Walker, to me, if Larry Walker had played 10 years earlier... You could say this about a couple of guys that were, that were really good in the 90s. If Larry Walker had played 10 years earlier... He would have been in the conversation for best player of the decade. Uh, Walker was a really good player in the 90s and eventually got his due uh, in the Hall of Fame. But he was so consistent and so strong for so many years that if he had done that in the 80s when Jim Rice's numbers were considered elite and not just really good, he would have been one of the best. Now, Canadian. I was going to say, do you think that's a product of where he played? And obviously you think of the Colorado thing and there's a stigma of what his stats mean, but... As you can see here early in his career, he played for the Expos, which were a team that they're up in Montreal, not a whole lot of buzz about them, except for the year of the strike, obviously. If he had put together the same career playing for, say, the Mets or Yankees and like maybe the Angels or the Dodgers, would he have been a no question about it Hall of Famer? He would have gotten there maybe five years earlier, maybe more. I, yeah, I agree. I think uh, he was... Montreal and Colorado aren't exactly, when you talk about, you know, worldwide coverage and, and notoriety, they're not exactly the top teams on that uh, in that list. I was going to say, and you're almost penalized for playing for the Rockies if you're an offensive player. Right, because they say, well, it was Colorado that did it. And speaking of the Hall of Fame, here's this guy who Dave, once visited. Dave Valley, who, uh, he, he was the Mario Mendoza of his era. Let's look at these batting averages. Oh, these are when they, he was still early on, 256, 231, and 237. There was a time when uh, when Dave Valley's batting average was a big deal because it was Mendoza-esque. He would, have been a, he would have been a better hitter if his name was Dave Peak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Valley wasn't so good for him. Ernest Riles. There's some Ernie Riles for you. So I think we talked about this in a previous episode, mm -hmm. but I think Ernest is spelled four different ways on baseball cards through the years. He had a decent career uh, in longevity. And I think that this Ernest is E-R-N-E-S-T. I think there's one with an A, E-A-R-N-E-S-T. And then there was Ernie, spelled two ways as well. And in this instance, Ernest went to shortstop. <laughs> Didn't, camp was not an option for him. Well, in March, I guess. Paul Gibson, left-handed pitcher. Now, you're not going to believe this. No, no offense to Paul Gibson here. Very next card, I didn't do anything to him. We've got another pair. <laughs> two Gibsons. Pair of Gibsons. <laughs> oh, that is that is crazy. That and this one's a jackpot. This this pair is going to beat a whole lot of pairs because <laughs> Kirk Gibson uh, beat a lot of pitchers in uh, in the eighties and even into the early nineties. We're just going to cycle through that one Jim and Trevor. move on to another guy hey. early in his career. How about that? Craig Biggio, catcher, a rookie. I. Did he have cards in 89? I, it's either his first he, or second. He did in tops. I don't remember if he does in Fleer. Yes, he does have in a Fleer, Fleer one. Okay, so this is a second-year card. But at this point, it's pretty obvious you've got a great player in Craig Biggio. And he, he went, you know, eventually from catcher to second and then onward. But uh, he I was, was going to say, not an error card when you see catcher at the bottom. No, right? it's weird. And then his kid, Kevin with the Blue Jays, is a second baseman. And there was a Dave Henderson in addition to a Ricky Henderson. Right. Both played for the A's. Your homework, since you have decided to tune in and thank you to this baseball card illustrated. I want you to watch Dave Henderson's home run in the 86 ALCS. It's the game that unfortunately over time has been known for Donnie Moore and 
and uh, and what happened there. But you have to watch what Dave Henderson did hitting the home run. Uh, because he he hits this homer and jumps out of the batter's box, literally just straight out of the batter's box, straight up in the air, and very clearly injures himself. <laughs> he hits the ground and then limps for a couple of steps, and then the adrenaline of hitting a homer in the playoffs takes over, and he rounds the bases. But I I don't know if I've ever seen a player. No, I have. Martin Gramatica. Uh, <laughs> it's the only other player I've seen go from celebration to injured like that. <laughs> I remember one year Paul Molitor hurt himself running the bases after hitting a home run. It wasn't even a celebratory type thing. He just injured his hamstring <laughs> rounding the bases. <laughs> Tough to do. That's oh, Ron Gant. See, and there, so that's Ron. That's like four Ron Gants ago. Because uh, Ron Gant was, I mean, look at, look at this. The, there's nothing about this card that tells you about Ron Gant except the name Ron Gant. First of all, that's a skinny dude on that card. Second... Look at the position. <laughs> Second base? Ron Gant was the Lonnie Smith of his era. He was he was an outfielder that was trying his best to make it so he could hit. I gotta say, that almost seems like something that you would see in a video game. Like, well, I got this guy that can hit, where can I put him? Defense doesn't matter. <laughs> Second base, second Ron base. Gant at second. It's it's RBI baseball with the All Stars <laughs> when you pull all those guys off the bench at the, the National League All Stars and put them at second and catcher. I'm going to dress this up here a little bit with some Ooh. action series stickers. Oh, these aren't just regular ones. They're action series. And boy, do we have a collection here. And here's a team you like a lot. Ooh. Look out now. Atlanta Braves. That is, uh, that of course, that logo uh, was going to come back a couple of years ago. The Braves put that on a, uh, one of their spring training hats and then... There was enough backlash; they took it off the spring training hat. But they, there were, and few... not just because no one wanted to relive the '70s and '80s <laughs> yeah, Braves. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know that that does play into it. I think <laughs> so. Here's a here's one of those. Every pack you have a question, right? There's a there's a, a driving question that comes out of every pack, and this one is: John Wetland was a Dodger. I thought the overriding question when. You bought this pack? <laughs> <laughs> How many pennies did you give up for this pack? John Wetland was a Dodger before he was a New York Yankee, before he was a Montreal Expo, uh, and he was a, a tremendous pitcher in his career, but he started as a Dodger. And here's a guy that played for every of the teams. Yes. <laughs> you realize, uh, now that now that I know this game we're, we're, we're doing where it's your best players, for your favorites and my favorites, and we're seeing how many of them we pull out of a pack, I should have chosen Jamie Moyer because I could have won because there's a Jamie Moyer card in every set in the of all time. And we were talking about like poker things. We could have had a a flush of uh, <laughs> Jamie Moyers. You could have had every nine different cards of him with nine different nine teams. Nine different teams. <laughs> That'd have been so great. So Jamie Moyer at the at the time of this card is uh, we'll, we'll assume it's the spring of 1990 in this card. Jamie Moyer is 27 years old. So he's got 30 more major league seasons in. In dog years? <laughs> Celsius? That's what they used to say about Julio Franco. <laughs> Celsius? That's crazy, though. Jamie Moyer was uh, was fantastic for a lot of years. Now, I'm not going to say that somebody had previously opened this pack, but what's going on there with Hubie Brooks? <laughs> and his face says the same. Hubie Brooks. Hubie Brooks? Hubie Brooks? <laughs> Un another he underrated. B. Brooks. He B. Brooks, another underrated guy with the Expos. Well, was he? St he was still playing here. <laughs> Bob Boone in. You know, we joke a little bit about guys like. Well, not even joking in the case of Moyer, but some of the cards we come across with. Oh, he played in 1971 or whatever. Bob Boone was teammates with Ty Cobb. <laughs> and with his kids. We'll flip over to the back here. He actually 1971 is the first year that they have stats for when he was in the minor leagues, but. <laughs> My good, I thought for sure he was managing by this point, not still playing. <laughs> Bob Boone played for a ton of years. He actually coached third base this year while playing. You know, yes. it's one thing for like Pete Rose to have played and managed, but usually you don't have guys coaching bases unless it's Little League. So, you know, uh, the, the Boones have a, a three generation history. Ray played for the Tigers, Bob's dad. And then, of course, Bob's kids are, are the ones of the, the most recent generation, Aaron, who's now the Yankees manager, Brett Boone, who was a great second baseman. I, Bob Boone played long enough. He could have played with his dad and his son. He could have been Ken Griffey Jr. and Ken Griffey Sr. <laughs> Pat Clements. I, the only thing I can see is the jersey. 
We're going to cycle through a couple cards here quickly because there ain't much to say. Uh, rainbow uniforms after the fact when it was just rainbows on the sleeves. How about Kurt Young? Wow. That's a, that's wow, a lot of yellow, man. Here's a name that you would have to be a Blue Jays fan to have any idea who he is. Goose Gazzo. Yep. Goose Gossage? Well, I'd say, so Morrow was his first name, but they but they called him Goose. He... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like to venture into a lot of weird personal territory, but I'm going there if I can. Uh, he, I fact, think knowing who this is is weird. We, we can go back to this, and you can see in, in his minor league stats, I know you can't really read it there, but in 1988, he pitched in, uh, in Memphis. Uh, in 1988... By choice? By, yeah. He, he, he left it was the, actually an accident. He was supposed to be pitching in Chattanooga. <laughs> yes, and, but his car broke down, so he pitched for <laughs> Memphis that year. Uh, I lived in Memphis in that year, 1988, and uh, my dad was in, in car sales, and uh, Mauro Gazzo, or as he, they called him Goose Gazzo, bought a car from my dad. Wow. Yep, 1988. And, and at that time, he was a huge deal in, in this, uh, to, to the little base in Memphis. It was like, oh, he's going to be a big pitcher, and we know the answer there. I am stunned <laughs> that you have any idea who that guy is. <laughs> how, how about this? Do you know who this is? Benny DiStefano was, uh, if, if I'm you not mistaken. You were in third grade with him? <laughs> <laughs> Benny DiStefano has a piece of history. Was he not the most recent left-handed catcher? You know what? You might be right about that. Benny DiStefano. Born in Brooklyn, New York. The last left-handed catcher to play in the big leagues was Benny DiStefano, who caught three games for the Pirates in 1989. Wow. So there is a lefty catcher. It does not happen in baseball. You're, you're testing the limits I, here. Oh, we know I, him. I'm sure you know who Andy Van Slyke is. Oh, we got uh, <laughs> former professional wrestler Greg Gagne. <laughs> that, that joke is never going to get old to me, even though that's from one of our first episodes. <laughs> Um, you may have heard of this guy, who, if I'm not mistaken, is on your team. Oh, that's right, Cal Ripken. Yes, indeed. That's a run for Kevin if you're keeping score at home. I that that to me, that's the guy that originally saved baseball. It, McGuire and Sosa were the ones that supposedly saved baseball after the strike. I think it was Cal Ripken. His streak uh, happened right as baseball was returning from the strike. Um, it caused alarms to go off everywhere. <laughs> Final four cards as they're searching for Burt Blylevin for some reason. <laughs> Circle me, Burt! Got <laughs> Roger McDowell. Roger McDowell, who was still playing then. Former MVP, George Bell. Jorge. And from The Simpsons, it's Steve Sachs. Yes. Mike Sosha can't be far behind. I'll bet in one of these packs we pull a Mike Sosha. I'm making that prediction. I can't wait to find out. We'll, we'll go for that next pack right after this here on Baseball Card Illustrated. Thanks for watching Baseball Card Illustrated. While Kevin and I are always on the lookout for our favorite players and rookie stars, we sometimes stumble upon a card with an unusual photo. Part of the fun of this series is pointing those out, and here is a starting nine of some of the more bizarre cards we've opened to date. Let's see if we can add to that roster with this next pack. Baseball Card Illustrated rolls on with pack number two and this flashy Detroit Tigers sticker. <laughs> so we have we have an addition to the Hall of Fame. We have Walt Terrell, the White Sox. You have Home Baby Roger Craig, and now the 1990 Detroit Tigers. By the way, what we've learned though is you have to apparently be a National Leaguer to be a card on yes, the wall. But an American a sticker leaguer. will work. <laughs> so where does that leave the Astros and Brewers? Is my question. <laughs> oh, Damaso Garcia. Sorry, you, you were going to say something before I threw that up there. Uh, I, the other day there was a, uh, on satellite radio, they had a show, the top 30 songs this week in 1990. <clears throat> now, since we're opening a 1990 pack, <laughs> music was terrible in 1990. <laughs> it was so bad. I, I've heard ones from other years, and I, okay, this song is good, this song is good. Those songs were awful. <laughs> they were the, they were the, that 1990 baseball cards of music. <laughs> Most of them worthless, but a couple of them good. I'm going to say, and mass-produced. Oh, man. All right, so Damaso Garcia, Montreal Expo, soon to be Atlanta Braves, soon to be retired, because that's how they went back then. Bruce Suter came to the Braves and retired. <laughs> Scott Scudder. Oh, you got me on that one. <laughs> I've heard of him. Have you? I don't remember that name. Also heard of this guy. Greg First baseman, Walker. Greg Walker. He was uh, in when the, the other, quote, live ball era was going on in 86, 87, when they talked about baseballs being juiced. He was one of those that, that uh, benefited from that. He hit 
27 home runs in 1987, and then 13 the next two seasons combined. And in 1987, he also struck out against Dan Plesak when the Brewers finished off win number 13 in a row to start oh, the season. Ooh. The streak, team streak, Terry Steinbach. Yeah, so the 1990 A's were, were pretty incredible. Still getting it done. And, uh, and then they added, 1990 was the year that they, you know, they started out as a great team defending world champs, and then they added Harold Baines. And somebody Hall else of Famer came. Harold Baines. That's right. I might add. That's right. And then another, they added two big names at the deadline, and it was like, they'll never lose. <laughs> uh, the answer was they never won in the World Series. They got swept that year. 1990s World Champs, the Cincinnati Reds. Here's Jeff Brantley, who my fondest memory is. He was on my fantasy league team for years as, for some reason, a relief pitcher. You know what my favorite, what my, my memory of him is? What, you beat me because of that? <laughs> <laughs> he, came to, he came to speak at, at Mississippi State when I was working there, and I said to him, I had you on my fantasy team last year, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and we both looked at the ground awkwardly for like five seconds because he was terrible, and, and it would have been 2000, so he was terrible. <laughs> How about a little something, you know, for the effort? Woo! Oh, Mark Eichhorn. The, uh, the the side armor. Yep, absolutely. I thought this is something that would make a comeback yeah, in this day. Not, not these cards. The, <laughs> the, the throwing motion. Because Mark Eichhorn fooled a lot of batters, especially right-handed batters, because he had these sweeping curves mm -hmm. that would start at the batter's ribs and end up on the outside corner. And I think in this day and age where it's all fastballs and squaring up fastballs, this guy would be effective. I was going to say, you've seen a number of guys that maybe not had that kind of uh, – pitch or delivery but you know you've had your sidearm or underarm guys if you will with um who's who's the guy i'm thinking of here's a fun game who am i thinking of dan quisenberry no but he was around that era no young, young kim recent guy um <laughs> not recent but is it the red sox the mets um and he threw from way under yeah chad bradford thank you wasn't that a fun game boys and girls <laughs> 20 questions are you Chad Bradford? Are you Jimmy Ray? Kevin wins a sticker that he's going to get to put up during the next break. That's his prize for well, that. Well, you know I'm going Brewers. <laughs> At both leagues. You got it! Hey! And no, I did not set that up. <laughs> just sounded like an idiot he's, a, he's got a kid in the big leagues. Trevor, pitcher for the Angels. There's Edgar Martinez, another Hall of Famer. Wow, look at Edgar when... This is back when everybody had a mustache. Mustache, mustache. He was still playing a little bit in the field, too, right? At this Third time? base, it says, yeah. So he's not Early the, on. the DH. Ooh. Okay. Pedro Guerrero, since, we're, since we've been talking a lot of real-life stories and not, not baseball card stories, it's very weird to see him in a Cardinals uniform because you know him and I know him and the world knows him as a Dodger. Mm -hmm. He had a stretch early in his career where he was on fire for the entire month. I think it was June. I hope I have the month right. And Tommy Lasorda... Did not want it in his head that the month had changed. So he had a special calendar put up in the clubhouse that said June 32nd, June 33rd, <laughs> June 34th. So that, and I don't think he thought Pedro was dumb, but I think the idea was he wanted it in, in his head that it was still June. I was going to say there's a lot of things in baseball that, not necessarily calendar related, but just kind of weird things like that. Because when you've got a streak going, you don't want to do anything that might potentially mess with it and... Here's your here's your homework. Google Tim Flannery streak, and that will answer that question to the links players go to. Um, speaking of streaks, I think we've got some kind of streak of getting this guy's card out of some <laughs> of the older packs we've opened here on Baseball Card Illustrated. Another Marty Barrett. Marty Barrett. I think. Can I go back and add him as my second baseman? Yes, you'd have like 27 <laughs> cards. Marty Barrett and Jamie Moyer would win this for you. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. I gotta say, and Marty Barrett didn't play forever like Jamie Moyer did. No, he was he was decent for a very short amount of time. <laughs> and apparently, in every pack of baseball cards, who knew? Oh, Ron Hassey. Okay, I'd have to go back and look, but Ron Hassey caught. Did he catch three perfect games? He caught at least two, and I'm pretty sure Ron Hassey caught three perfect games in his career. Um. We're going to double check here. Oh, I'm sorry. He's the only player in Major League history to catch two perfect games. And they were 10 years apart. So here's the crazy thing. This is Ron Hassey with the A's. 
uh, won a World Series in 89 with the A's, but he caught Len Barker's perfect game in 1981 and Dennis Martinez's perfect game in 1991. There you go. There's Von Hayes. Von Hayes. Boy, the, uh, the Phillies traded the universe to get Von Hayes in the early 80s, and he was supposed to be the one of the great players in the big leagues. You ever see the what that trade was? Von Hayes from uh, from the Indians to the Phillies? I have to I have to go look it up, but it was they, a baseball trade. Well, and, and it was it was literally <laughs> several guys. It was five for one, and one of the five was Julio Franco. Here are your five guys for this guy, Von Hayes. The Phillies gave up Manny Trio, who was an All Star in his career, George Vukovic, Jay Baller, who I don't know who that is, Jerry Willard, who won a World Series game with a sack fly, and Julio Franco in the second of his fifty years in the big leagues. Say, Five for one. <laughs> so we got a very appropriate card here. <laughs> we got Pat Borders on a card with a black border no. in a set that, generally speaking, has white borders. And by generally, you mean all the time, except this one card. Except this one card. So and it, it's a parallel. It sure is. How, who knew that 1990 Fleer was the forerunner of parallel sets? And like I said, I bought a box of this when I was a kid. Never got one of these cards, so this is a special day for wow. me. I have to look this up on eBay. Pat Black Borders. <laughs> who knew? And back to reality with R.J. Reynolds. Oh, tobacco guy. Aren't you glad we got that card? Oh, twins, man. He hung around. That was between the two championships, 87 and 91. Look at that. Sandy Alomar Jr. is that, a Padre. I was going to say, that's a very early in his career card. So they, he was teammates with Roberto Alomar mm -hmm. then, right? Yeah. As, as very young San Diego Padres. Wow. Interesting. And they both went on to really good careers. Obviously, Roberto was uh, the guy that, that went on to you know the Hall of Fame caliber career. Sandy, not quite so much, but they were both really good. And they would later become teammates with this guy. Oh, and now, if I'm not mistaken, do you know what Dave Winfield was traded for what? when he became a Cleveland Indian? What? Dinner. Is that true? Oh, because it was during the strike. It was right before the strike, so they had already made out the deal that was going to send Winfield over there. And they decided that the proper compensation would be a meal <laughs> when the, I think it was what, the twins at the time he was yeah, with? Yeah. Coming over at like the next winter meetings or whatever. Okay, buy us a meal, and we'll call it even. <laughs> so, Dave Winfield never played for the Indians. So right? Dave Winfield was acquired for the cost of a couple steaks. <laughs> you don't know. It might have been less than that. Well, <laughs> who knows? It might, it might have been on the cheap back then. Glenn Wilson. There you go. So I, I said you had glasses. your, uh, by getting that question right earlier, here, here's a couple other stickers you can choose from, too. Oh, look at that. So we'll, we'll leave that out there for you. That, that, that run in red is pretty exciting. Now here's a card that I remember getting back in 1990, and I thought it was a cool card. No real specific reason for it, but that just kind of screamed the end of that big glasses era of <laughs> like the late 80s, very early 90s. Well, okay, so the Cardinals were known for base stealing for years leading up, and you hear a name like Alex Cole. Baseball is a very weird way of how names sound like things. You can hear a name, and it sounds like a second baseman or a shortstop. Alex Cole sounds like a guy who will steal 100 bases. Right? Doesn't he? Yeah. and He didn't. I was going to say, and he came up just a little bit short, probably because guys like this were <laughs> trying to throw him out. Joel Skinner. Right, he probably wasn't one of them because he was in a different league at the time. But Catch him with that, with that batting helmet on. He's, he's ready to go. How about this? Isn't this your favorite Seinfeld character? Oh, Keith Hernandez. <laughs> I, you know why I've never grown facial hair? Because every time I start, I hear him go, Your stash is trash. <laughs> That's one for you. Mike Smith. Mike Smith. <laughs> yeah, this is... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is brilliant. And we got Pete Smith coming up next. Where Mike came from on this, I don't know. But here's two guys that have... Here's the connection. And I don't know if you've ever seen the episode of Cheers. These are two guys that have never been in my kitchen. <laughs> and it's true. Let's just move on from this whole thing. Unless you had something no. about fake Mike Smith over here. No. <laughs> Greg Cattery. That was one of those old Berman nicknames. He, would, he did a play on Cabaret with Greg Cattery. I remember that. We talked about Lonnie Smith fairly recently, didn't Skates. we? Skates. 
You understand how his nickname was Skates. Yeah, I don't he, remember that. Yeah, they called him Skates because he, when he would try to make plays in left field, he looked like he was out there on skates. He was always tripping and jumping around and sliding <laughs> and just the, he would turn a, a routine fly ball into an adventure. And then, of course, uh, became sort of vilified. He, you know, he's still kind of happy there. This was before the great decoy of 1991, Game Seven <laughs> of the World Series. Lonnie Smith is about to take second base on on what is a hit and run. And he slides into second, and the, the, the hit is a double. The hit is good enough to score a run. But I think it was Chuck Knobloch at second base went over, faked a tag. Lonnie Smith slid into second thinking the tag was coming in. That was enough for him to only make it to third and not score on this double. And the game went into extra innings. Braves would have won a World Series had he not been decoyed. And instead, now they're in distress with yes. their old logo. <laughs> That's accurate. Don Carmen, not in San Diego. <laughs> Ruben San Diego is in Texas at this time. <laughs> Ruben High Sierra. Big leg kicking. They call him Ruben San Diego. I like it. Where in the world is Ruben <laughs> San Diego? He's, uh, he, yeah, that high leg kick and that crazy swing. Here's the other thing, too. The, most logos at this point in jerseys are way less offensive than they were 10 years before. The brightness is gone. The, the colors are getting better. Stadiums are about to start looking better in, in this 1990 world. It's coming. Hey, 1990, Camden Yards isn't far behind. Just hang in there. <laughs> but that T on that helmet is 1979 incarnated. Steve Searcy. Dave Schmidt. Dave Schmidt. Where's a Mike Schmidt? These things come in pairs. We settle for a Kevin Bass. Mm -hmm. Large mouth. <laughs> and finally, with this wow. pack... One of the best pitchers of the era. And, uh, just amazing. I mean, 59 scoreless innings in a row in 88. Uh, part of that, that Dodgers team that, that beat the A's despite being so... Uh, you, I mean, you go back and look. The, the Kirk Gibson home run that was hit. I mean, he was, he was hurt, right? He's hobbling around the bases. That was like half of the Dodgers team. That the A's should have swept that World Series, and they lost it four games to one. And partially because you could put a team on Oral Hershiser's back. I wouldn't do that now. He's in his 50s. I was going to say, I don't know how well he could carry it at this point, but <laughs> we'll carry on with another pack of, of 1990 Fleer here on Baseball Card Illustrated. After I put my logo on the board. Thank you for watching Baseball Card Illustrated. As promised, Kevin gets to put the logo of his choice on our board. We're going to go with the Reds right down here under Walt Terrell, who I think played for the Reds. And next to that Reds logo, you can see, thank you for watching, and please subscribe if you're enjoying what you're seeing. Now on to the next pack of 1990 Fleer. Pack three of 1990 Fleer on a special edition of Baseball Card Illustrated. And while you're unwrapping that, I wanted, I just want to rattle off some of the top ten artists uh, in 1990 on the on the musical chart. Jane Child, Lisa Stansfield. Tom Brunansky. Tom Brunansky probably could have had a top ten hit. Callaway, Michael Bolton. Oh, Michael Bolton. Oh, yeah. How can we be lovers if we can't be friends? The Tom Rodansky theme song. You know, he actually sung it to Lee Smith. <laughs> oh, Lee Smith. That's a guy, too, that, that uh, lost in the years is, is how good he was for how long he was. You know how easily closers lose their jobs, even good ones, ones that are top five or ten, top ten in a year. And Lee Smith... He almost had 500 saves. Wasn't he at 478 in his career? I was going to say, you're talking <clears throat> about different eras in baseball, and it certainly was in a number of respects. But closers, you're right, held on to their jobs for a long time. Well, there's there's the number one way you know it's a different era. Look at what's happening behind Jim Corsi right there. Those are people in the stands in Oakland. Well, maybe that's not Oakland. Yeah, I think it is. It is Oakland. Well, you got to remember, Oakland was good back then. They so. were. So here's a card, Tommy Herr. <laughs> now we've got a new thing here on Baseball Card Illustrated where we send cards in through the mail to a couple people out of each uh, set that we go through. And Tommy Herr is going to be one that we send to because reportedly he signs through the mail. Okay. So things we track here on Baseball Card Illustrated, that's one of them. And we're going to see if Tommy Herr will sign this card of him with the Phillies. It's <laughs> awesome. Now I'm sure you can come up with something about this particular gentleman right here. <laughs> wow. 40 or 50 pounds before we knew him, David Wells as a uh, Toronto Blue Jay. He does not, I don't see the earring. He was he was known early in his career for pitching with the with the uh, stud earring in the left ear, which at the time was 
a huge deal in baseball. Like that, I don't remember that on any player before David Wells. Uh, Let's just say David Wells did a lot of things that maybe hadn't necessarily been done before <laughs> during the course of his career, including pitching a a uh, perfect game with a raging hangover. <laughs> on a completely different note, we've got one of the players from Team Bronco. Oh wow! A very young Barry Bonds, not a rookie card, not even that close to be honest, but but certainly a Pittsburgh Pirates card, which was definitely early on in the career. So the thing about Barry Bonds, and you know, a lot of people say you know, the steroids and, and that sort of thing. Barry Bonds was before this time, before all the steroid era of baseball came out, when he looked like this, you would not accuse this person of steroid use for sure. His 1990 season. 33 homers, 114 runs batted in, 52 stolen bases, and he hit 301. His OPS was almost 1,000. Those are incredible numbers, especially in 1990. Barry Bonds was arguably the best player in baseball in 1990. I think Ricky Henderson was probably number one at that time in that year. But he's if he isn't top five, then we're doing it wrong. And that's the thing that blows my mind. Barry Bonds would have probably faded a little bit into the sunset later in his career and probably been a Hall of Famer. I was going to say, pre-speculation Barry Bonds was certainly on that Hall of Fame, if not had already maybe even clinched Hall of Fame status. But, yeah, Barry Bonds, part of a great team with Pittsburgh in this era, too. National League MVP in 1990. One of just a handful of times. <laughs> well, I guess in the scheme of things, it is a handful. Yeah, well. but Three of them early on, though. Three of them before you'd, you'd start in with the speculation, for sure. You know how many MVPs this guy won? <laughs> Two in Little League. Yes. He was quite yeah. the player, I heard. I don't know. I, he might have had some competition. Wrightstown, Ohio, or wherever he... Or, let's see, where is... Uh... Oh, if you get that right, then you get to put all of the stickers on. There go all the other cards. Well, that's okay. He is from Dover, Delaware. Yes. He might have been the best player in Delaware. <laughs> that, that is possible, or the only one. Joey Cora. Now we're, now we're going to see some guys. Ready for this? Clay Parker. But the Yankees were bad at this time, that, which is a weird thing to say. Oh, look at, look at these. These are rookies, right? These are major league prospects is what they're called. Rich Monteleone and Dana Williams. They're happy. They didn't get much of a cup of coffee, though. Look at Ray Searage. He had plenty of cups of coffee he did. on this day, even. He's still around. He's a uh, he's pitching coach. Pittsburgh Pirates pitching coach, Ray Searage. I think he's preparing for his pitching coach job. There. Look at Jeff Musselman. John Costello. It's funny. 1990 was such an odd year in terms of your, your normal greats. The Yankees, the Cardinals, uh, the the uh, Dodgers, the Giants. So I'm looking at the next card here. Oh, now you might know a little bit about him a because bit. he passed through Atlanta. But yeah, this was this was the great. You know, the Braves uh, in the '80s were were awful. Is not the right word. We have to come up with a new word like super duper super duper plus awful or something like that. And this guy was going to be the savior of the of the franchise in the mid '80s. He had a ton of power. Uh, he was he was going to be the guy. He was he was a can't miss kind of guy. He might have been even like a first round draft pick. Let me look at this. Well, it won't be in here, but he hit 32 homers in AAA in 1987 for the Brewers AAA team, and then uh, didn't do much in the big leagues. I was going to say you mentioned the Brewers connection here. I don't know why I remember this, but I remember being a fan of his. He played seven games in 1980, let's see, probably seven. 87 for the Brewers. Yeah. And for some reason, I liked the guy, and then he disappeared. Yeah. And so you and I had that in common from our childhoods. Now, reportedly, he's another guy that will sign through the mail. So we're going to send this card as well. So we're going to try Brad Commons and Tommy Herr and see, uh, see where that leads nah, us. That's extremely cool. Nice to uh, see a player still do that. You know, they're humble enough to do that. Oh, you're going to put on the Ritz here, huh? We, we sure are. And, yeah. and th there it has been applied. <laughs> Phil Bradley played for someone other than the Seattle Mariners. Who knew? Oh, I thought Ken Harrelson for a second. I was going to be like, you can put it on the board. Yes. yes. 
What's right. kind of interesting here is he's leaning up against the wall there so he doesn't fall over. Yes. Hard night of uh, going out the night before. Yeah. There's the uh, White Sox hat that's uh, so much fun. Dwayne Murphy. Wow, that's like 10 years after I thought he was playing. He was one of those early 80s Oakland Athletics guys, but he was still around in 1990. Let's say, speaking of athletics. Oh, Alfredo Griffin. One of the best all-star ever. Best all-star story ever. <laughs> Well, I'll let you hit that. The, he, I'll move on to the next one here. The, basically, the all-star team was short a player, and Alfredo Griffin was out there. He was either just hanging with a teammate or there to see family, something to that extent, and uh, they, they needed a guy. So it was the day of the game. He was the one player in town. So here, Alfredo, grab a uniform. And, he, and I think he was hitting like a buck fifty. But if I'm not mistaken, we pulled the card of the guy that, um, I don't know if invited is, that – yeah, invited because you were allowed to take a teammate or one person with you to the All Star game if you were nominated. And cycling through these cards isn't very quick because there's about a thousand of them. Well, now you're looking for black bordered parallels. That's the problem. <laughs> if you found were, one. And I think it was the first card we pulled in this uh, episode, and I, now I can't find it. I, oh, here it is. I believe this was the guy. Damasel Garcia. <laughs> who, like Alfredo Griffin, soon became a 150 hitting infielder and, and, and well, toppled over. Had a little bit too much fun at the All Star game. <laughs> and I'm not even going to make the obvious comment there, but there's Doc Gooden along with this. Wow. Possibly a rookie card. Maybe not, but possibly a rookie of John Smoltz. Young John Smoltz. The, uh, the, the trade that brought him to Atlanta happened actually a few years before in 1987. The rare case of a trade that kind of worked out for both teams, yeah. too. Doyle Alexander went to the Tigers. They were in a pennant race. He did his job for them. It was fantastic for them. I finally saw, and I don't remember this when it happened, but I finally saw the, the Braves television broadcast where they announced the trade. And they, they, the, the two announcers are talking. They say, well, they got a, a kid named John Smoltz. His ERA... For Glenn Falls, didn't even know they had a team. He, they didn't say that. That's my addition. <laughs> is over five, and uh, said, but apparently the kid throws really hard, which was sarcasm for oh boy, which fit everything about the Braves at that time. Boy, he did it. Little did you know that that was the beginning of turning everything around. That's the truth. Look. Kevin Brown is a Ranger. Look at that ill-fitting hat, giant T on it. That could be a throwback. There's a throwback for you as well. Ooh. Wade Boggs and Mike Greenwell. Boston had a good team in 1990. Oh, man. And speaking of teams in 1990. So, so this is the most accurate action pose ever. Because remember that leg kick was all the way up. And he would just rear back and throw with every bit of that huge. He's like 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and he was throwing with every bit of that huge body. It's just that sometimes he threw it at the plate. Sometimes he threw it at Doug DeCenzo when he was going down the first baseline. Sometimes he threw it into the center field stance and injured people. Like, you know, it wasn't always toward the plate. He had a temper. I'm going to say that kind of came into light last year when, uh, who was the guy with the Indians that did it? Was it Bauer? Yeah. Yeah, Trevor Bauer was not exactly happy and just yeah. picked the ball up and threw it over the fence. And so they traded him to Cincinnati where... They've seen that before, I guess. I gotta say they're prepared for it there now. So, <laughs> Greg Swindell, fantastic pitcher from the University of Texas. Can you picture a Texas uh, set of teams in the mid '80s that had Calvin Schiraldi, Roger Clemens, and Greg Swindell? I don't, th I don't know if they were there at the same time, but they they were there at various times. And Charlie Liebrandt was oh. there too because he was everywhere. Charlie Liebrandt, the the king of the postseason fail, and that's, and that's a terrible thing to say because Charlie Liebrandt. Pitched well in a lot of postseason games, but in 1992, when the Braves needed him against the Blue Jays, he gave up runs in, in the what was the deciding game. In 1991, the Kirby Puckett Game 6 homer that led to We Will See You Tomorrow Night, Charlie Liebrand on what he called the dead fish ball, which was this sort of like hanging, floating, off-speed pitch that would, would go to the outside corner on a right-handed batter, and Kirby Puckett watched it, hit it, and sent us to tomorrow night. There's Chris Basio, who threw a no-hitter for Seattle in his career. He did, and then then asked for Eric Thames to be drug tested after the game, even though <laughs> Thames was probably negative two years old at the time. Well, there's a Harold Baines card you don't necessarily expect to see. A Ranger. It's funny because Harold Baines is a guy, you, you look at Cal Ripken, 
um, Tony Gwynn. These are guys that are one franchise guys. And it, it, if you if you don't think deeply, you go, well, Harold Baines was that guy. He played for the White Sox, and that was that. No, he, he bounced a little bit at the end. Jim Clancy, fantastic novelist. Also looks a little bit like Mark Twain there. <laughs> Dick Schofield, son of former Major League player Dick Schofield. <laughs> Kelly Gruber. Every Tim Kirkjian stat on ESPN ever mentions Kelly Gruber of the 1987 Blue Jays. He was a great player for his time. Another guy that because it was uh, Canada, he didn't get his due. And I think we're about to see another one, aren't we? And the final card on this edition of Baseball Card Illustrated. It's Montreal's Kelly Gruber. Tim Wallach was a fantastic... Let's, let's grab stats on Tim Wallach, shall we? Real quick, we're just going to read stats. We don't do this much here, uh, but we're going to do it with this one. Tim Wallach, 28 homers in 82, 22 homers in 85, 26 and 123 runs batted in in 87. He was, you know, they didn't hit a lot of homers in the 80s. He was he was prolific. He sure was. <laughs> <laughs> dot, dot, Dynamite dot. drop in, Monty. <laughs> Woohoo! They don't call him the best in the biz for nothing. That's the thing. They're, they're, he, you know, Canadian third baseman, Canadian third baseman. So just like maple syrup, you may not know about it, but it's it's good across the border. Thank you for watching our look at 1990 Fleer. On behalf of all-star Alfredo Griffin, Canadian third baseman, Kevin, I'm Bronco. So long, everybody. You've been watching Baseball Card Illustrated.